The Peter Schiff Show. Well, all the talk last week in the financial media was the fact that several Fed officials had given speeches and they had somehow put April back on the table as a live FOMC meeting where the Fed might raise rates. In fact, even earlier this week, even yesterday, uh, early in Singapore, you had some guy from the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco saying the Fed should continue with its rate hikes. Everything was great. It should stay on target. But last week in particular, several guys were chiming in about how uh, April was a real possibility for another rate hike. Now, for one second, I did not buy that. I mean, remember my commentary I did Friday, right? I, I, the title of that was Fed Bankers Bark, But They Won't Bite, because I never bought for a second that they were actually going to raise rates in April, even though the market was somehow looking at these comments and actually taking them seriously. In fact, the commentary that I put out in the middle of last week, as all this stuff was going on, my commentary was titled Two Down and Two to Go. And if you haven't read it, it's on the Europe Pacific Capital website. It's, you know, it's on my the Shift Radio website. But I argued that the Fed had already dispensed with two of the four rate hikes that it had telegraphed we were going to get this year, uh, earlier in the year, late December. And I said two down and two to go, meaning they were going to take the other two rate hikes away. So as everybody else was now anticipating, hey, maybe the Fed is going to raise rates in April, I was saying not only aren't they going to raise them in April, they're not going to raise them at all uh, in 2016. Well, what happened today? Janet Yellen gave a speech in front of the Economic Club of New York, and this is probably one of the most dovish speeches, if not the most dovish speech that she ever gave. And as a result of this speech, the price of gold was up about 20 bucks on the day. We closed above 1240 In fact, a couple of days ago, we almost got back down to 1200 I mean, we never quite hit 1200 We got like maybe 1206 1207 I forget the exact low. But I also think that that's very interesting. And it tells you a lot about the strength of this bull market, that even with everybody believing that the Fed was maybe about to hike rates uh, as early as April, that despite that, and despite the rally in the dollar, gold would not get back below $1,200 an ounce. So to me, that's very bullish. The question is, when will all the bears throw in the towel? You know, Goldman Sachs, they're still looking at for gold, what, $1,900? they are still looking for a strong dollar and a bunch of rate hikes. Although Goldman Sachs is not as bearish on gold as Harry Dent. You know, Harry Dent is calling for $700 gold. At least he was uh, when I debated him on the Alex Jones show on Friday. And by the way, if you haven't seen that, it's up on my YouTube channel. It's a good debate. We argued a little bit. I think I was getting a little bit under his skin. I think, you know, I mentioned a couple of Harry Dent's previous calls. Like, you know, he had Dow 36,000. That didn't pan out. You know, I like Harry, but he always throws out these exact numbers. And he acts like he never gets anything wrong. Like, this is where it's going to go, and these are the exact numbers. And, you know, he always has these extreme numbers, and I, I rarely see him. In fact, now he's calling for Dow 6,000. And I, I thought I remembered that he was calling for Dow 1,000. I mean, maybe he was at one point, but a few years ago, he was calling for Dow 3,000, right? And so, you know, now he's 6,000, but, you know, not as low as 3,000. But still, I don't think the Dow is going down that low. It potentially could go down that low or lower if the Fed actually raised interest rates a bunch of times and tried to shrink their balance sheet. But I don't believe that's going to happen. So I am not uh, bearish on the stock market the way Harry Dent is. And I'm certainly not bearish on the gold market uh, the way Harry Dent is. But what Janet Yellen said basically got everybody now who was so convinced last week that we might get a rate hike in April. And now that rate hike is off the table as quickly as these other guys put it on. The dollar was down across the board today. The dollar index barely held on uh, to the 95 handle. It closed, I think, at 95.15 off uh, not quite a full percentage point on the day. 
Uh, but Aussie dollar, very strong on the day. It was up 1.4%. New Zealand dollar, I think, was the big winner on the day. That currency was up a, a full two percentage points on the day against uh, the U.S. dollar. The Dow Jones liked the dovish news coming from the Fed. Dow up just under 100 points. I think one of the reasons it wasn't up more is because you got the financials in the Dow weighing it down. You're looking at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ was up almost 80 points, 79.8. That's a 1.7% increase. But hey, the NASDAQ was standing still compared to the gold stocks. The GDX index of gold stocks up just under 6%, up 5.77%. The DGXJ, which are the juniors, they actually were up even more. They were up about 6.3% today. So that's where the action was. And I think that's where the action is going to continue to be based on how dovish Janet Yellen was. And I still don't think the conventional wisdom appreciates the extent of this dovishness. I mean, this is uber dove. And let me kind of go over uh, what Janet Yellen spoke about. I mean, first of all, She, again, she started off her prepared remarks with a pretty upbeat assessment on the economy. I mean, she said labor market's looking good. Consumer spending is looking good. I guess she didn't see the numbers that I'm going to get to that came out on Monday. But consumer spending was looking good. The housing recovery continues. She went over all these positives, right? She did list a couple of negatives, right? Minor negatives, uh, manufacturing and net exports, but she kind of blamed all that on on the strong dollar. She did also mention that capital spending and business investment was lackluster, uh, and she was noting in particular some of the weakness and the layoffs in the energy sector. But overall, she was still upbeat on the economy. In fact, she admitted that the Fed's assessment of economic growth, inflation, and unemployment were the exactly the same on December in the December meeting when they raised rates and in the March meeting where they didn't raise rates. She said that the Fed's outlook on the economy had not changed at all, hadn't changed at all. Well, if it hadn't changed at all, why didn't they raise rates again in March? Because they were anticipating they were telegraphing four rate hikes. And if all of their assumptions about the economy had stayed the same, then why didn't we get the rate hike? Now, she actually mentioned that in the Q&A. There was a couple of questions. It wasn't a lot of Q&A. There were two guys uh, that were allowed to ask uh, questions, some some big economists. And so in the Q&A, she kind of got into that. But what she did mention that had changed between December and March was that financial conditions were weaker. Right. Obviously, she's referring to the stock market having gone down, although she acknowledged it came back up. But also she was talking about developments in global economies that would normally be weighing down on the U.S. economy. But she said, but because the weakness abroad ended up leading Americans to anticipate a lower federal funds rate because they now have anticipated fewer rate hikes, that that pushed down long term interest rates, which is helping the, the housing market. So she kind of acknowledged that the only reason that the weakness abroad isn't impacting us is because that weakness caused people to realize the Fed wasn't going to hike rates. And because they're not hiking rates, that helped the housing market, which is helping the U.S. economy, which is kind of an admission that what the Fed is looking at is the financial markets, not necessarily the real economy, because the real economy hasn't changed. Yet she admitted in this speech that the Fed now sees a rate path, a trajectory of rate hikes that is slower, that is more cautious and more gradual than they saw in December. This is the first time they're really kind of admitting it. It's not just the dot plots. Janet Yellen is saying that even though our assessment of the economy hasn't changed, we now see a more a shallow or narrow glide path. We expect that over the coming years, interest rates are going to be raised more slowly. And what she did say is that the Fed now believes that the neutral rate is near zero for the Fed funds rate, which means the Fed funds rate minus inflation, that she thinks the neutral rate, meaning where the Fed is not stimulative or uh, restraining economic growth, right, where it's not loose or tight, but just right, right, the neutral level is now closer to zero than what the Fed originally originally believed. Now, Janet Yellen did mention uh, inflation 
And her main concern is that it wouldn't be high enough. That's the one thing that still concerns her is that inflation expectations uh, are too low and that they may they may take too long uh, to get back up to to two percent. But she did mention in her prepared remarks that if the economy weakened or if inflation was lower than the Fed is hoping for, that the Fed still has the tools to deal with that, that they can still cut rates although they can't cut them much because they barely raise them, they could work with their forward guidance, which they're doing today, because if anything, she's already easing with the forward guidance she expressed at today's meeting. But obviously she could dial up the dovish rhetoric. But she also mentioned going back to a version of Operation Twist and quantitative easing. No, she didn't say quantitative easing. She said, well, we can go back to our asset purchases. Well, what's that? That's quantitative easing. So now the Fed is talking about quantitative easing and and cutting rates because financial conditions are less favorable today uh, than they were in December, even though their economic forecasts have not changed, which to me, I don't believe that. Because if you remember, the Fed's official GDP forecast for Q1, right, for the first quarter of this year, Towards the end of last year, if you go back to her press conference, the Fed was looking for the economy to grow about 3% in the first quarter of 2016. And now, today, you have Janet Yellen saying that the Fed's expectations for economic growth haven't changed since that statement was made. Well, how can that possibly be when we've got all this bad economic news that has come out? In fact, what Janet Yellen said to justify, and this was in the Q&A, because she was asked, hey, wait a minute, if all of your economic assumptions haven't changed since from December to March, then, you know, why didn't you raise rates? And what Janet Yellen said, and this, you know, I hadn't anticipated this, but remember, I kept saying that she was going to have to come up with an excuse because Yellen doesn't want to raise rates, but she doesn't want to admit that the economy is weakening because she doesn't want to peddle fiction. She wants to tow the administrative line that Obama is spinning, that everything is great, and that Hillary Clinton wants to ride that wave into the White House. The economy is great. So how does Janet Yellen not raise rates and still pretend that the economy is great, right? Because you'd be raising rates. So this is what Janet Yellen came up with. She said that even though our assumptions about the economy haven't changed, our assumptions about the appropriate level of interest rates have. What she said is the Fed now believes that given all the economic growth that they expect and that they still expect, and given the level of inflation on unemployment that they expect, the rate of interest is actually lower now than what they thought in December. Now, they didn't actually come out and say they were wrong, but basically that, that's what they're admitting. They're saying we weren't wrong on our forecast for growth. We were just wrong on our forecast of what interest rates should be given that level of growth. Now, maybe what Janet Yellen really figured out is if they raised interest rates, the growth would go away. So maybe that's an admission that in order to maintain or sustain the level of growth that they had forecast, that they can only do that if they don't raise interest rates. But she didn't basically put it in, in those words. Now, one of the well, probably one of the funniest, uh, or not, I don't know if it's funny, kind of ridiculous uh, answers before I get back and talk about some of the economic data that came out yesterday, which is particularly germane given what Janet Yellen just said in her speech today. What are the questions focused on the Fed's assumptions for uh, labor productivity, which are built into their models? And the question had to do with the fact that labor productivity has been very, very weak in the United States these past five years. I mean, exceptionally weak. And the question was, Given how weak productivity has been the past five years, why is the Fed assuming such a big improvement in productivity in the next five years? And I didn't even realize that, but apparently in their economic model, the Federal Reserve is, is assuming a big increase in productivity. And the, the question was, why? I mean, why is the Fed so optimistic, right? What, what evidence are you basing your optimism on? Because productivity has been so lousy for so long, what, you know, what makes you think it's going to turn around? 
And they're not just assuming a return to normal. They're assuming a big surge in productivity. And I couldn't believe Janet Yellen's answer. And again, you can't believe that it doesn't provoke a bigger re response or reaction from everybody else, because this woman is supposed to be the brightest of the bright, right? She is the one steering this economic ship. And her answer just shows you that she has no idea how to drive the ship, right? Here's what she said. She said, well, we've noticed that. We noticed how weak um, productivity was these past five years. And you know, we have no explanation of why it happened. So it doesn't make any sense to us that productivity is so low. It just kind of went down for some unknown reason. And so therefore we're gonna assume that it's just gonna go back up for some unknown reason, reason, right? We don't know why it went down. So we'll just assume it's gonna go right back up. And we don't know why it's gonna go up, but we're just gonna assume it's gonna go up because we're gonna assume that what went down for no reason will also go up for no reason. That, I mean, that's not the exact words that she spoke because that would have looked even more ridiculous, but that's the gist of what she said, right? That is the, the you know, common language translation. Of what, of what she said, which is completely ridiculous. A, that she has no idea why productivity is going down, and B, after she admits she has no idea why it went down, to just assume that it's going to go back up. And of course, those assumptions are obviously thrown off all of their forecasts for the next few years because they're based on something that's supposed to happen, yet she has no idea why it's going to happen. She's just you know, like it's just going to magically happen. Just like productivity magically went away, like the productivity ferry decided, you know, to wave a wand and away went productivity. And now that ferry is just going to come back and, and wave it again. And now it's all going to come back. I mean, first of all, if you really had no idea why productivity was falling so much, wouldn't you just assume that whatever that trend was, was going to continue? Why would you assume that it's going to magically turn around? I mean, because obviously it has to be going down for a reason. Even if you don't know what that reason is, to assume that it's just going to turn on a dime and just go like V-shaped v the other way. But the reality is anybody can tell you why productivity is going down. I mean, there's a million reasons why it's going down, or maybe not a million, but there's a bunch of them, and it, a lot of them start from the White House. A lot of them start from President Obama. Did she ever think of something like Obamacare? Didn't she ever think that the presence of Obamacare was doing something about productivity? What about Dodd-Frank? What about all these programs, these business unfriendly programs? What about our tax code? What about all these new regulations that people have to deal with? Don't you think that that has something to do with productivity? And what about the Fed? What about what the Fed is doing? What about Janet Yellen's 0% interest rate policy that is inflating bubbles, that is preventing markets from functioning properly, that's preventing a restructuring of our economy? What about punishing savers and rewarding speculators? What about underwriting and monetizing all this government debt so the government, which is a big drag on productivity, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So it drags productivity lower and lower and lower. It's the Federal Reserve, it's the government, it's the Obama administration that are working together to undermine productivity. And why is that going to change? I mean, if we reelect Hillary Clinton, which I think is Janet Yellen's goal, that's not going to make our economy more productive. If she continues to chair the Federal Reserve, that's not going to make our economy any more productive. All the things that are destroying the productivity are going to destroy it even, even further in the future. But for her to say, I have no idea why productivity is falling, and therefore I'm just going to assume that it goes up for, for no reason also, is a completely ridiculous answer. And, you know, she got all this applause at the end of her speech and she's smiling as she sits down. What did she say? She said nothing. She didn't say anything intelligent. She read her statements from a prepared text, right? So she read it all off a teleprompter and then she had two questions and she gave BS crazy answers that made her look like a complete fool. And the problem is the audience is full of complete fools too. So they were too foolish to realize how foolish the speaker was. Now, let me get to the, the economic data that came out yesterday. Yesterday was the big data. And before I get to the, the real big number, let me just talk about the uh, merchandise trade numbers that came out, the trade in goods, right? This is where we have huge deficits. So the deficit last month, this is in merchandise, not the combined one that has goods and services. This is just the goods, right? So this is a much bigger number. So last month, the deficit was $62.2 
And the consensus for this month was $62.5 billion. The number was they revised last month up to 62.4 from the 62.2. And this month jumped all the way to 62.9 uh, ahead of the 62.5 that was expected. So in other words, our merchandise trade deficit was larger than it was originally reported in January. And it was an even bigger deficit in February than the one that they had forecast. But here is the big number, right? Personal income and spending for February. And if you remember, in January, everybody was excited because personal income was up 0.5%, right? That was supposedly the good news, right? Remember back then, back in uh, the Atlanta Fed, oh yeah, they were real optimistic. They were ratcheting up their expectations for economic growth because, hey, consumers were spending more than we thought, right? Remember that? The number that we were supposed to get for February was supposed to be a slight increase, 0.1%. But that was supposed to be on top of the 0.5 that we got in January. So we're just going to build on that momentum just, you know, just, uh, just slowly. Well, the numbers came out and we actually got the 0.1% increase in consumer spending that had been forecast. But... They revised down the 0.5% increase from January to another 0.1. So it was one-fifth of what it was originally reported. So we didn't add 0.1 to January's 0.5. We added 0.1 to January's 0.1. So it was 0.1 for January and February. That is extremely anemic growth in consumer spending for the first two months of this quarter. Now, personal income was still up, again, slightly. It was up 0.2. But consumers are not spending. The savings rate is rising, which is a good thing long term. But when you're trying to uh, sustain a bubble, and the bubble is all about consumer spending, that's the last thing anything wants is to, for the consumer to save some money that he could otherwise be spending. Now, remember, all of the hope and the optimism for economic growth in the first quarter was built on consumer spending. Well, now the whole foundation has collapsed. And if you remember, when the Atlanta Fed initially revised up its forecasts for first quarter GDP in January, they got all the way up to 2.7. Remember that? I did a podcast about it, and I said, this is ridiculous. This must be the Federal Reserve trying to pressure the Atlanta Fed to get with the program right, to stop uh, peddling fiction, uh, to be optimistic. The Fed was all talking about all this great economic growth. And why was the Atlanta Fed? Because their initial estimate was like a much lower number, like 1.2 or something like that. So they ratcheted it up to 2.7. And there was all kinds of news stories. Everybody was covering it. There was all, you know, I read on the internet all kinds of reporting of the, the Federal Reserve, uh, Atlanta Fed. Hey, this is great. What did I say back then? I said, look, this is a huge mistake at the Atlanta Fed. They're going to have to walk that number down. Uh, they're going to have to constantly reduce that guidance as they get all the bad economic data that I knew was coming. And every time they lowered it down, in fact, last week, they lowered it all the way down, I think, to 1.9, right? And because it, it was 2.4 before, they had kept lowering it. No, then they lowered it to 1.4. Yeah, they lowered it to 1.9. Then they went to 1.4. And I kept saying, it's not enough. They're going to keep doing it. They're going to keep doing it. Well, as a result of this big downward revision to consumer spending, the Atlanta Fed yesterday brought down their estimate for first quarter GDP to 0 0.6. 0 0.6. That's it. We're almost down to zero. 0 0.6. Now, remember, I just went over and I said that in her speech today, Janet Yellen says that the Fed's outlook for economic growth hasn't changed that it's the same now as it was in December when they raised rates. Well, back in December when they raised rates, they were expecting growth to be 3% in the first quarter. Now the Atlanta Fed is saying, no, 0. 0.6. And at the rate they're not, they're, they're ratcheting it down, we could easily be negative. So if Janet Yellen is this dovish when she still believes the economy is going to grow close to 3% when the Atlanta Fed is saying, no, it's closer to zero, can you imagine how much more dovish the Fed is going to get when they have to acknowledge how weak the economy is, because right now they're still in denial. They're saying everything looks great. They're saying we don't even believe any of this bad economic news. In fact, all they talked about 
on CNBC. Once the Atlanta Fed did this, and it wasn't just the Atlanta Fed, because you had a lot of other you know, organizations, banks that try to handicap the GDP, everybody notched down their, their expectations across the board, right? And so I'm listening to you know Steve Leisman and all his buddies, and they're all having these conversations. And basically what they're saying is, well, you know, I guess GDP is obsolete now, right? It doesn't work in a modern economy, you know, because obviously we have all this economic growth. Look at these jobs. We're creating all these jobs. We have this low unemployment rate. That is not consistent with an economy growing so slowly. Therefore, we must need a new way to measure GDP because this old way doesn't work because it's obviously missing all this growth because the growth must be there because we have all these jobs. But it's not just the jobs because all the other economic data that we get is consistent with the GDP data. The only outlier are the jobs. Why doesn't it dawn on these guys that it's the jobs numbers that are wrong? Everything else is right. And in fact, the jobs numbers aren't even wrong if you understand them. If you understand that we're creating part-time jobs, low-paying part-time jobs to replace the higher-paying full-time jobs that we destroy then you understand how weak the labor market is and how it reflects a weak economy. When you understand the mass exodus of people out of the labor force. In fact, Janet Yellen even mentioned that herself reluctantly in her speech. She mentioned that she still thinks there is slack in the labor market due to the excess involuntary part-time workers and all the workers that are out of the labor force. She acknowledges that the people who are out of the labor force might want to come back and that the people who are working part-time, they might want a full-time job. So she reluctantly now is acknowledging this slack. But the bigger point is, how can the Fed see all this weak economic data come out in the last couple of months and, and say with a straight face that none of this has in any way altered their forecast or perception about the economy? The only reason they could say that is, is it's political. They don't want to admit that the economy is weakening. But they don't want to raise interest rates, so they came up with this BS story about how they still think everything is great, but they just think interest rates need to be lower in this great economy. And, what, of course, what she said is that, well, you know, going forward, we're still data dependent. And so if the economy ends up being stronger than we think, well, then, you know, we might actually have to adjust upward what we think uh, the appropriate Fed funds rate should be. And so maybe we'll get back on track with rate hikes if the economy strengthens from here. But if it weakens from here, then we're ready to do, you know, cut rates and do QE4. Well, it's already weakened. They just haven't acknowledged that. So it's only a matter of time before I think the Fed's going to have to come up with another rate cut and uh, more quantitative easing. The one thing the Fed did not mention is negative interest rates. So maybe they're not prepared to go there yet, but I'm sure they're going to take us there because they've admitted that they were thinking about it. Right? And they're studying it. Well, if they're dumb enough to even consider it, they're probably dumb enough to actually do it. A couple of quick points just want to make uh, to round out this podcast. One, you know, there was a stock today that collapsed down about 50% because they're filing for bankruptcy. This is Sun Edison. And this is one of these uh, renewable energy companies, green energy, uh, Obama. You know, I remember the, the, the president of this company or CEO of this company was traveling around with Obama. They were going on some international trips together. You know, this was like, this is the future, right? right? This is what the president likes, these kind of solar powered, alternative, clean energy stuff. Well, now they're filing for bankruptcy. This stock is down better than 50% today. It's down over 98% from its 52-week high. And it's down over 99.5% since President Obama was sworn in, right? So this is another example, right? Because everybody jokes, you know, we shouldn't let government pick winners and losers. Well, they don't pick winners and losers. They only pick losers. <laughs> it, it'd be okay if they picked a winner once in a while, although I would still be opposed to it because I want the market picking, not the government. But when the government tries to pick winners and losers, it only picks losers. But the biggest losers of the week have got to be the uh, low-skilled workers in the state of California because those idiots out in California, and Jerry Brown is about to sign this crazy law that the legislature is handing him, they're going to raise the minimum wage 
for the entire state, not just, you know, it's just not just San Francisco and Los Angeles, the entire state, which is going to include like Fresno and Bakersfield and all kinds of places where incomes are a lot lower than they are, you know, in the big cities, they're going to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour statewide. What a disaster this is going to be. The only salvation is that there is a rule in there, apparently, that says that if unemployment is going up or if the economy is in a recession, they can call off the rate hikes, which in a way acknowledges that they're bad because they're selling this as as it's good for the economy. If you listen to all the promoters, everybody who's celebrating, they're saying that these higher wages are good for the economy because they are going to you know, raise incomes and therefore the people who have higher incomes are going to have higher spending. So if you think a higher minimum wage is good for the economy, why would you want to call off the rate hike if we're in recession? Wouldn't you want to accelerate it? I mean, if it's good for the economy, isn't it even better in a recession, right? If higher wages mandated by the government help the economy, wouldn't we really need that help even more if we were in recession? The fact that they're actually saying, well, if there's a recession or higher unemployment, we'll call it off is an acknowledgement that it hurts the economy. It doesn't help it. And they don't want to hurt the economy if it's in a recession. And it's an admission that it hurts employment because they're saying, well, if unemployment goes up, we won't do it. That's an acknowledgement that there's a connection between higher minimum wages and employment. So even as they're passing it, they're admitting that it's bad, but they're doing it anyway for political reasons because you've got so many idiots that believe that despite all the laws of economics and common sense, that the government forcing uh, businesses to pay $15 an hour is a good thing. And again, that's not how you should look at it. It's not the government saying a business must pay somebody $15 an hour because they don't have to. The business cannot hire you and they'll pay you nothing. What the minimum wage really does is it applies to workers. And it's telling a worker, if you can't deliver $15 an hour worth of productivity, and believe me, it's not $15 an hour. You look at all the taxes, payroll taxes, workman's comp. You know, if you're a California employer and you're paying somebody $15 an hour, all in your payroll costs are probably closer to $20 an hour, right? So now you've taken the economic job ladder and you've knocked out all the rungs, $2 an hour, $5 an hour, $7 an hour, $10 an hour. You've got to jump on the $20 an hour, right? You've got to, you've got to be able to deliver $20 an hour worth of productivity or you can't work. Right? You can't accept a job. That's what the minimum wage is. It's not about what employers must pay because they don't have to pay anything. It's what er- workers have to be able to earn. So if you're living in California and you don't have a lot of skills, in fact, there are a lot of people in California that don't even speak English. Right? I mean, talk about low skilled. You don't even know the language. How are you going to get $20 an hour? You can't even speak English. Right? So you've got all these people. Now the government is saying if you can't convince somebody to spend $20 an hour to hire you, you know, 15 to you and five for, you know, all these other government taxes. If you can't convince an employer to pay you that, then it's illegal for you to get a job. That's what they've done. Now, the other way you know that the legislature and the government know it's a bad idea is it doesn't fully kick in until 2022. This is 2016. Why do it over six years? If it's so good, do it right now. Why delay the benefits for six years? The way it works is I think the wages will go up 50 cents in January, then another 50 cents January uh, of the following year. Then it's going to go up a dollar a year until it fully hits uh, 15 bucks. And I think if you're a small employer, I forget what it is, under 25 workers, you get an extra year to get to $15. Oh, big deal. An extra year, right? But so they're trying to delay the pain by by pushing the in, the increases out into the future so they can kind of cover up some of the unemployment. But here's how this is going to backfire, right? Because if you're a businessman and you employ a lot of low-skilled labor and you know that the costs are going to ratchet up, you know, how this much over the next 5 or 6 years. You know that, right? When you are trying to decide if you want to replace those low-skilled workers with automation with computers and robots, right? That decision is always a cost benefit. It's always what is the cost of hiring people over a period of years versus spending some money up front to make the capital investments in computers and robotics so that I can use the automation instead of people. And generally, the cost of automating is an upfront cost. I mean, yeah, there's some kind of routine maintenance of the equipment, but most of the money is a front end cost. You buy the machines and then, you know, you get a payoff over time. But you have to compare the cost of buying the machines up front 
versus the present value of the wages that you would pay your workers during that time period. Of course, the machines don't last forever. They depreciate, and at some point, you have to replace them. But you do an analysis. And obviously, the more expensive wages are, the higher that you're going to assume what you're going to pay your workers. And if you know that wages are going up 50 cents, 50 cents, a dollar an hour, a dollar an hour, you know, for every year, you build in that $15 cost six years from now into your present day assumption of the cost of workers. And that makes the cost of machines that much more competitive because now you're jacking up the cost of workers. You're telling workers, Hey, you know, you're making it harder for workers to compete with machines. Let's say at $10 an hour, a worker can beat a machine, right? Let's say the cost of the computers or the robots, whatever, let's say that that ends up being $12 an hour. So if I if I can work in for $10 an hour, I can beat that machine. I'm more competitive. So maybe the employer will take a risk in hiring me than spending money on machines and computers. But if you make the minimum wage $15, I don't have a chance. I can't compete with the machine. The machine's 12. I'm 15. I'm out of a job. Plus, of course, there are other things about computers. When you have robots and computers, they don't take breaks. They don't get sick. You know, part of the thing they did in this new bill in California is more mandated uh, sick days. Well, you don't have any sick days with a computer. In fact, the computers and the robots will work holidays. They'll work weekends. They'll never complain, right? They're never going to be late. They don't want vacations. And the one thing they'll never do is sue you. They, they can't sue you for discrimination. They can't sue you for sexual harassment. They can't steal from you. I mean, so you got all kinds of benefits that you get when you have robots and machines. The human being needs to be able to overcome that. And now you're making it harder and harder. The one main benefit that I think humans give over machines is a lot of people prefer to interact with other humans. But you know what? I mean, preference is one thing. And cost is another. I think most people, if it comes down to the cost of a hamburger, if the hamburger is going to be 50% more expensive if it's served to you by a human than if it's served to you by a machine, most people will say, okay, fine. Just like most people choose to pump their own gas. They don't want to interact uh, with the, the guy at the gas station and have them pump the gas because they pump it themselves. It's cheaper, right? And so this is what's going to happen. And, you know, the real shame of this too. I mean, obviously the biggest problem is all the people in California who are going to lose their jobs. All the people in California who are never going to get jobs. All the young people, all the high school kids that are not going to get summer jobs. They're all the kids that are trying to work their way through college. No job at all. All they're going to get is debt. They're not going to have any jobs available. Apart from that, look at what we're doing. I bet that all the machines and the computers and the robots that all these fast food restaurants in California are going to buy to replace all these workers, those machines are probably made in other countries. They're probably made in Japan or they're made in Korea or someplace else. We're going to have to run up our trade deficit. We're going to borrow money to buy imported machines and fire domestic workers. And one of the other reasons, and this is to bring the Fed into it, one of the other reasons that investing in machines in automating with computers and robots one of the reasons that it's so inexpensive is because of the fed because the biggest cost of these capital investments is the interest expense of borrowing the money to make the investments well the fed is keeping interest rates really low so now we can go into debt and buy more foreign goods and run up the trade deficits so we can fire all of our domestic workers who are now going to go on welfare and food stamps. So now we're going to send the trade deficit up. This is a disaster wrapped in a disaster. The only thing good about it is this is going to be such a colossal failure in the state of California that talk about a laboratories, right? They say the United States is a laboratory of democracy. We got 50 laboratories. Well, we already know this experiment is going to fail, but just we need to see a spectacular failure in a big state that everybody can see. And then maybe there'll be a lesson that the rest of the country can learn. Unfortunately, it is going to be a very expensive lesson and a very painful lesson, especially and ironically for the very people in California who this law is expected to help. Because all these people who are so happy that they think they're going to get $15 an hour, they're going to get $0 an hour. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't going to be any minimum wage workers in California. There's still going to be some minimum wage workers there, but not these minimum wage workers, right? Because employers, if they have to pay the $15 an hour, right, plus extras, they're going to want a higher caliber of worker than the ones who they're currently paying a lower amount of money. 
And they're going to get a higher caliber of worker because workers who wouldn't take a job, let's say at $10 an hour, will take it at $15 an hour. Right now, those workers aren't applying for those jobs. So the lower skilled workers get those jobs because higher skilled workers don't want them. But once you force the employers to pay $15, then people who want $15 an hour jobs can now get them serving French fries. And so the people who are now serving French fries at $10 an hour, because that's the best job they can get, now there'll be no jobs that they can get thanks to the government. There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is. Truth in Media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with truthinmedia.com. Led by award-winning journalist Ben Swan, truthinmedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make truthinmedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks the truth to power. It's also where you can tune into The Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit truthinmedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access the Truth in Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They're all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com.